Hello there, everybody out there in investigative tabletop role-playing land. Uh, welcome to the Pelgreen Press Gumshoe Scenario Design Workshop. Uh, I'll explain what many of those words in that title of this uh, streamed event mean in a moment. But first, uh, the participants ought to introduce themselves. So uh, I have uh, several of my boon uh, Gumshoe compadres uh, with me uh, to help out as we uh, design a scenario before your very eyes so that you may uh, emulate what we do in your own work. And uh, first on the agenda, uh, Kenneth Height. Hey, <clears throat> I am, as Robin alluded, uh, Kenneth Height. I'm the designer most recently of Fall of Delta Green. Uh, before that, uh, for Paul Green, I've designed the Gumshoe Games Knights Black Agents and Trail of Cthulhu. And for Evil Hat, designed the Gumshoe Game Bubble Gumshoe. My most recent Gumshoe scenario is Operation Alonzo, which will appear in the either forthcoming or just released, depending on when you're watching this, Borellis Connection uh, campaign uh, book for Fall of Delta Green. And next up, we have uh, Gareth Ryder Hanrahan. Uh, hi, I'm Gareth Hanrahan, uh, and my role in Pelgrane is to follow these two around producing large scenario books based on their works. Uh, in that vein, I did the uh, Zosny Quartet and large chunks of um, the Persephone Extraction from Network Agents, as well as the Dracula Dossier with Ken. Uh, I did Dead Rock 7. I did a bunch of scenarios between Three Blues. And um, most recent work is the rest of the Brothers Connection, which is uh, coming out soon and very, 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 very long. <laughs> Thanks to Ken's detailed outline. <laughs> uh, and I am Robin D. Laws. I am the designer of the Gumshoe system and uh, of such Gumshoe games as uh, the Yellow King role-playing game, which we'll talk a lot more about in a moment. And also the original uh, Gumshoe game, the Esoterrace, uh, Fear Itself, Mutant City Blues, uh, and Ashen and Stars. And uh, the uh, let's talk a bit uh, about uh, scenario creation for uh, mystery scenarios. Uh, one of the maxims of role playing is that uh, adventures, uh, published adventures, don't have a huge uh, market uh, compared to the core books because for most games, it's fairly easy to design your own entertaining adventures, right? Uh, if you know Dungeons and Dragons, the, the grandpappy of them all, uh, all you need to have an adventure there is a room, uh, a hallway connects to another room. There's something in each room. You find it out, take the treasure, and that's all you really need to have a, a great time. But a mystery scenario uh, is rather complex, and therefore uh, there is an avid audience for uh, people to uh, purchase published adventures, which they can either then uh, follow quite closely or, or riff on, uh, because uh, adventure plotting uh, has to uh, scenario investigative scenario plotting has to uh, work in two directions. It, something has happened that the characters need to investigate, a mystery has solved, and what <coughs> has happened has to make some measure of logical sense or the investigators can't uh, figure it out because there's no logic to uh, grasp. So you have to make sure there are no plot holes in that direction. You also have to prepare for uh, at least one way for the uh, characters who, like in any role-playing game, you have no idea who they are uh, when you're writing the scenario, uh, what they're going to do and how, in what set of stages are they going to uncover that mystery? And is that also going to make sense? Are they going to be able to uh, find all the information they need uh, to move uh, from one uh, scene to the other in the course of the uh, scenario? Uh, one of the things about Gumshoe, which of course is not the only role-playing game that does investigative missions that is uh, particular, is that you never fail to get information. Unlike uh, some older systems, uh, which would require you to roll, uh, for example, to uh, find the uh, particular document you need on the hard drive to then go to the abandoned warehouse out on the edge of town, uh, in uh, Gumshoe, uh, you would just use your computer ability as you would in any other game, except you wouldn't roll if the information is uh, necessary to move you through the adventure or just more fun to get than not, which, spoiler, 
is the case in almost any piece of information, you get that information. And so the challenge uh, there is less about do you randomly uh, get to uh, earn all of the pixels that allow you to move through the storyline, but rather you get a whole bunch of information, then you have to assimilate it and see what matters and figure out what's really going on, which is closer to what real world investigation is like. Uh, for all of the Gumshoe games, uh, we set out a particular uh, formula or framework in which a standard adventure occurs. Uh, you can, of course, deviate from that all you want as a GM if you're improvising, um, or uh, as a, uh, a writer of published adventures, either something you're submitting to Pelgrane or something through the uh, Gumshoe Community Publishing Program. But especially if you are trying to impress uh, either uh, other game masters or uh, potential publishers at Pelgrain, uh, the thing that you want to do is start by following this particular formula because it's then very clear to us or clear to game masters whether you have grokked how it works. And the frameworks uh, are there to make sure that you have all the elements you need for a, an adventure that you can actually uh, play through. This brings us to the uh, scenario that we're going to riff together today uh, for uh, the Yellow King role-playing game. Uh, this is a game that is based on the horror works of Robert W. Chambers. Uh, these are four stories that he wrote in 1895 about a, a strange, mysterious play called The King in Yellow uh, that uh, when people read it, it sort of infects the reality and changes uh, the world and changes people's minds in a, a horrific uh, way. The Yellow King role-playing game has four different uh, sequences or subsettings uh, within it. Uh, one in 1895 Paris, uh, one uh, in a, an alternate reality war in the middle of the last uh, century in Europe, uh, an another in a, a world uh, which is uh, an alternate reality present day after 100 years of dictatorship have been overturned and uh, you uh, the revolutionaries who helped uh, make that happen are trying to rebuild society and still deal with the weird, icky dangers in the corners. But the one we're going to talk about today is the most accessible one. It's called This is Normal Now. Uh, and uh, it is the one uh, where uh, it's you're putatively in our reality dealing with the effects of the Yellow King, uh, his uh, perhaps his... Uh, uh, daughters, Casilla and Camilla, the effect of the yellow sign, an emblem that changes people's minds. And in this game, we're looking for things that interact with the uh, everyday world. Um, and so at this point, uh, we're going to start by looking at the building blocks of a, a King in Yellow, a Yellow King role-playing game scenario. Uh, and uh, we're going to pull up our little Google Doc that we've prepared that have all of the elements of a uh, scenario in them. So you begin uh, with a hook. Uh, this is the thing that draws uh, the characters in, that uh, introduces them uh, to the mystery. Uh, there is then an alien truth. You decide what's going on behind whatever it is that's drawn them in. So it's a surprise that the players can encounter in the course of their investigation. And then we break that down into individual uh, scenes of investigation. Uh, so there's an introduction, there's core scenes, which are the uh, major scenes that you are pretty sure are going to be in the uh, scenario one way or the other. Uh, and then we have some alternate scenes, which are other fun, cool things uh, that can happen but don't need to happen or other ways to move through the, the story. There are antagonist reactions. Uh, that's what happens when the uh, enemies in the world or just the world itself notice what the characters are trying to do and comes at them. And so that's a way of injecting uh, danger and suspense amid the scenes of uh, investigation. And then, uh, surprisingly enough, it ends with a conclusion. Uh, and you may uh, have a, a scenario where the player characters in play go in a completely different direction and uh, wind up doing something cool and improvised, but you need to have some sort of baseline story that can happen so that it doesn't just fizzle out at the end. <clears throat> so on this note, uh, we're going to take uh, some 
suggested ideas that we got from our uh, pals at the uh, Palgrain Discord, and we're going to decide uh, which of them we want to go with, and then we're going to develop that out further. So what I asked for are uh, suggestions that sort of fit the vibe of this is normal now that take a sort of a contemporary uh, theme or idea and then uh, uh, put a, a Carcosan yellow skin, uh, yellow king reality horror uh, spin on them. <clears throat> uh, so our suggested premises are uh, one person uh, thought we might do a scenario based on strange beach wash ups. Uh, and uh, uh, if you, uh, we were given an article to uh, to click through, and it's a list of mysterious things that have washed up on on beaches. Uh, when you look at the list of twenty five, about nineteen of them are bits of sea creatures, which I'm going to go on a limb say possibly not that mysterious. Uh, and uh, there's a a giant D six uh, has washed up. Uh, D six, of course, is the uh, the only diet that gumshoe uses. So I think there someone was just trying, trying too hard to appease us. Uh, but we don't necessarily have to pick one of the strange beach wash-ups in that article. We could pick another one. Uh, someone else suggested that uh, uh, the fact that the CIA has for years used a, a rubber mask for its agents based on the face of the late actor Rex Harrison, uh, which... Uh, is very much in the Yellow King theme because uh, the uh, King in Yellow is notorious for wearing a pallid mask, except it's not a mask. It turns out it's this horrible face. Uh, someone else suggested the uh, contemporary trend of the moment that isn't so contemporary, sea chanties. Uh, and then finally, uh, someone else suggested a, a site that allows you to think that you are taking satellite images. Uh, and uh, this is something that Canon offers. They have a a, a satellite that uh, rotates the globe, uh, taking pictures of places, and you can dial up the place that you want to take a picture of, but in fact, they just give you one of their pre-cooked uh, pictures of that place because the satellite, uh, like with the rest of us, can't be everywhere at once. So, uh, uh, Canon Gar, is there a particular premise there that seems appealing to you, and, and why does it seem appealing to you? Um. I would, I, I, I would always love like strange stuff on beaches and sort of like you know weirdness from the shore. It's a bit more Cthulhu-y than Yellow Kingy, perhaps. But um, there's I think there's lots of potential there, and you could also bring in the sea shanties if you want to sort of merge those two premises uh, or premises and. Uh, have a whole nautical theme to it. Right, well, since we're uh, doing this as sort of an object lesson in how to uh, design, I think we're gonna stick with one rather than trying to get fancy and put two things together because uh, the first lesson I would like to impart with this scenario is don't start with too fancy an idea because you will fancy it up as you go along and the players will absolutely complicate it uh, once they uh, enter into it. So uh, a very simple, clear, uh, premise is, I think, a, a, a key to a a uh, strong scenario. Uh, Ken, what are your feelings on these various choices? Well, I mean, I, I think that in the way that uh, you believe that uh, the giant D6 was a, a, a love offering to Pelgrane in general, <laughs> I feel like a mask of Rex Harrison used by the CIA has to have been a love offering specifically to me, and it would be the act of a churl Robin to, for me to say that's not my favorite, because obviously that's my favorite. Uh, well, I guess that uh, leaves me then as the tiebreaker. And uh, I, I think that the thing with the Rex Harrison mask is that it is uh, a little harder to integrate with who the investigators are in This Is Normal Now, because in this one you are uh, just putatively ordinary people who turns out have other identities and other realities, who then are drawn into weird mystery. And getting uh, an ordinary cast of characters involved with the CIA uh, right away seems like a little tougher pull, because then you have to explain why ordinary people, once they find out the CIA is involved with anything, why would they ever uh, uh, mess with that, right? You know, they would back up uh, at speed. And so I think 
uh, let's, for the purpose of doing something simple, go with the uh, simplest possible one, and that's the uh, the beach the, the beach washups. So uh, the most obvious thing that could wash up on a beach that would uh, convey the basic premise of the Yellow King role playing game is a section of the terrible play itself, a bit of the text. Uh, and if people read the play, uh, they uh, lose their psychic equilibrium. They, some of them commit acts of evil, some of them discover reality dissolving all around them. And so uh, I'm, I'm gonna suggest then that this is a scenario that uh, is based on the idea that somebody is putting uh, pages of the play in bottles, messages in bottles to wash up on shore and then start to infect uh, people and make everything go strange and weird. So our next question then is whether we want uh, that to be the premise that the investigators know fairly early on that these are pages from uh, the, the play or do we want there to be some other hook that draws them in and the pages from the play are a revelation that occurs uh, later. What are your feelings on that, Gar? When you say like you know, messages in bottles washing up, I immediately think of like the, the Lake of Halle in Carcosa. And my sort of, the sort of image I initially flash on um, is like somebody you know, throwing bottles in from the far shore and they're arriving like you know, like throughout space and time as they're like you know, letters as opposed to just like you know, chunks of the play. And some like, they're cast away in Carcosa. Um, which is more of a weird image than a strong hook, to be honest. But uh, so I think that that's a that's a that's a long step towards the alien truth. Yeah. Right. If our if our weird thing that needs to be explained is parts of the play washing up, and um, uh, uh, and your notion of a of a castaway on the shores of the Lake of Holly, which is terrific, uh, I think that's a great reveal. Yeah. And I th and I think that um, uh, we can even assume that they are a castaway on the shores of Lake Holly. Perhaps they don't know that they're on the shores of Lake Holly, or perhaps they do. They're writing perfectly conventional, um, uh, uh, you know, help me. Here's my GPS coordinates, whatever type message. That when they throw it onto the lake, is being translated into passages from the play, and that perhaps. When you open up the bottle and you and you look at the message, uh, even perhaps some of the message still, like a palimpsest, is visible on the surface. But then, you know, as uh, as as you know, as as it is exposed to the air of our of our universe, it begins to change. So everyone doesn't begin by um, uh, by you know just going mad and eating their 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 girlfriend on the beach. They go and do other things, and then slowly, you know, maybe they are trying to, you know, report that this missing guy is at such and such a location. But as they attempt to explain it, they've been, you know, bottled up into the world of of Holly that way. That the messages aren't simply sort of like random, you know, go mad triggers. They're an attempt to communicate by the by the castaway that could be if the player characters um uh you know learn to you know resubmerge the the words in the lake in the water or something like that they they could be reverse deciphered you could you could understand that there's a uh there, that there's a human impulse behind it all so that gives us our alien truth which is that there is a uh prisoner on the shores of Hali sending messages in the bottle which are now washing up on a beach in our reality right and the prisoner might be one of the player characters' alternate selves, that they're in a prison camp from the Castain era somehow, or it might be some third force that they have met in one of the previous adventures, one of the previous settings, or it might be some other figure that, uh, if they could rescue him, they could get a really good piece of information about what's going on, um, uh, because obviously that person was marooned for a reason either they were exploring and went too far or they were grabbed by the uh, king in yellow or his uh daughters slash agents and uh 
put there like the prisoner on um uh in the village and so by the way the notion of uh carcosum the prisoner is so great (laughs) that it will now infect everything i suggest for this scenario so just be warned right well of course those two things are uh both within the broader tradition of the uh, uh existential mystery Mm-hmm. where uh, what you're trying to figure out is not just who done it, but what the heck is happening to reality. So they're mm-hmm. definitely already in each other's ballparks. Um, so is the, uh, the prisoner sending uh, sections of the play from Holly, or is he sending something else? Why would he send uh, pages from the play, I wonder? I, I, I love the idea of, of like stuff being transmuted as, as it passes through some sort of dimensional barrier. Um, so like he, he did, like, you know, one, one image that instantly uh, up to mind was like, you know, this bottle washed on the shore, you open it, and you get a text message from it. As in basically, the, 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 his like, you know, distress call on the radio or something has been transmuted into this, or infected by this carcass and stuff. So it's being transmuted to forms that can survive the crossing and then sort of partially retransforms on the far side. So you get both transmissions from carcosa and also clues as to. Like you know, the, like where he, where he was shipwrecked or how, like how how he got there, which the players can follow to to rescue. So, so are we suggesting that the he is writing uh, messages of uh, asking for help and they are turning into uh, bits of the play, or uh, or that they're somehow transmuting their form in some other way? Yeah, um, and we could either have it be that uh it's bits of the play but the passages from the play contain uh flaws or variant printings right so if you have a copy of the king in yellow from 1895 and you had already read it in a previous adventure and you were comparing the one scene to another it might say um uh uh he reveals the scalloped uh tatters of yatil in one but in the other one it spells scalloped with an O, not an A, and so that's a that's part of a code, and uh, you can um, you can assemble these variant readings, and that's what the truth is sort of steganographically uh, put into. Or it can be a, a simple act of transmutation, as Gar suggested, that the the lake itself is acting as a transmuting medium, and the messages begin as um, uh, as helpful signals or as simply, you know, distress calls and become passages from the play, but the passages when either decoded or experienced will allow you to sort of, uh, as Gar says, get a text message or get some other sense of a bearing uh, on the actual problem. This, and the only the only trouble is that we're, we're rapidly talking ourselves into building a, you know, rod of seven parts sort of an adventure, right? <laughs> yeah, I was just get, about to say. You get all seven messages and you put them together and, oh, look, here's the clue. Yeah. Go out to the old marina at midnight and... And, and also, uh, one thing that you want to do when you're uh, designing scenarios is you will find yourself spinning off uh, delightfully uh, complicated ideas. Uh, and then uh, often you might want to then go, can I simplify this a lot? Because uh, the players are then going to add a lot of complexity to it. And while I was hearing all of those uh, beautifully complicated ideas from uh, Gar and Ken, I thought, wait a minute, what if all he has to write on is a copy of the play and he's writing instructions on how to rescue him in the margins? Or if they're in the margins, you could do it the, sort of like the ransom letter approach with cutting up sections of the play and pasting them in. <laughs> Right. Uh, so let's uh, let's, let's go with yes. Uh, so uh, so we have our alien truth already, and so uh, in this instance, we're going to back up and come up with the hook. So uh, we've established that uh, people are receiving this these messages on the beach, and then it's resulting in them doing uh, strange things. Uh, we haven't fleshed out what those strange things are yet, uh, but. That leads us to the question of what is it that leads the investigators into the story in the first place? What is the instigating thing that alerts them to something going on? And uh, I think logically we're at the point now where one of the strange things that one of the people who receives one of these uh, bottles does gets their attention. So what uh, would we suggest as that hook, as the instigating thing 
that seems to be going on when what is <laughs> really going on is all about these uh, alien messages in the bottle. Mm -hmm. The player characters in this normal now are literally just normal people, aren't they? They're, they're, they're just like regular, ordinary people who have somehow fallen into this uh, orbit of strangeness. So they, uh, one of the tricks with this one is that they, you have to kind of motivate them to get involved in the early adventures. And then in the later adventures, they go, oh, it's another Carcosan thing and nobody else is dealing with this but us, so we got to jump in. But let's come up with a, a reason for people who perhaps, they know there's something weird going on in their lives. Maybe they've encountered a little bit of Carcosa before. So let's say this is like a, a second scenario in, in a campaign. Well the, so well, the simplest way is for one of the people to have found, who finds the bottles to be connected to one of the characters that they're their brother or their girlfriend or their uh, employer or somehow personally connected. It's and a, it's a classic Cthulhu thing, like you, you, you got a bottle from an old friend. Yeah, from an old uncle. And, uh, but in this case, you know, people are, are not just atomized uh, uh, things bouncing around the pinball game of society. Uh, they're connected to, to other human beings. And that part of the horror of Carcosa is that it, strips those connections from you so you know the 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 person uh who who they know in some other capacity has begun acting erratically they've perhaps um uh th th maybe they refuse to cross streets uh when the when, uh unless when the light is yellow or they uh have um a a, a sudden aversion to seafood that they never had there's just something weird and an unusual happening and it's getting worse it's not just oh i don't like shrimp now it's oh well she didn't like shrimp now and now she's only you know sitting pointing west now she's only sitting pointing west she doesn't eat shrimp and she's tapping you know her fork or, or her pen or something all the time and it's clearly a degenerative situation and maybe focusing on a point past your shoulder and looking at maybe something that isn't there so it's very clear that that person is being slowly consumed by the by the madness of carcosa in whichever symptomatic form your campaign already takes or in some new exciting symptomatic form and then it might be oh well this is a terrible thing to have happened to my brother girlfriend employer but it's no skin off my nose except that they while googling the symptoms discover there's now a message board for people who've, you know, had their brothers or girlfriends or employers show these same symptoms. And someone on the message board is saying, I'm going to look into this. And then that person disappears. So Ken, you've uh, uh, skipped to our next header, uh, which is what you do when you're creating a scenario. So uh, let's just call our hook, someone you care about will only sit West uh, mm -hmm. as our, uh, and, and that is a, uh, a catch-all term to describe this sense of psychic disturbance. And so uh, you discover uh, one of the, and, and this creates a great opportunity and is a great little tip. If you can find ways that require the players to supply their own details about the world that, that you can then allow the GM to hook into the scenario. So the way that you write this up is you could say, have a player who's next in line to get spotlight time, describe someone they care about, and then you then adapt the scene so that that someone you care about is the person who will only sit west, who's experiencing uh, this uh, disturbance. And so uh, that makes the introductory scene in which the investigators discover the hook and discover that there's a problem uh, pretty straightforward, which is that uh, yet another person in uh, their lives, uh, and let's just call this, let's call the, the person, the special person, the SP, uh, so so if third acquaintance, <coughs> loved one, tells the group that the SP, the special person, will only sit west. And so uh, when you're writing this up, you would describe uh, the scene. Uh, it would be kind of vague because you uh, have set it up to be uh, 
uh, have improvised content from the players where they're describing not just the loved one, but the other third acquaintance. And so that the scene where this happens would also be something that the player would likely supply uh, bits and pieces of. Um, it might also suggest that you tie this person into uh, more than one uh, other uh, uh, player characters so that they both have some sort of interest in the in this person. So it could be a shared professor or boss or uh, someone who, you know, it's, oh, well, this person was at my wedding. Oh, you know, he's the contractor who uh, helped set up my home. And then we play foosball every weekend or uh, whatever it is to tie more uh, people in. And so uh, this then brings us to what the core scenes are. Once you discover this, uh, there are have to be clues in that sequence that lead you to something. And so uh, eventually the players would be uh, trying to talk to the loved one. Of course, the loved one can't, I mean, the special person can't say, oh yeah, I got this mes message in a bottle from the beach and that's why I'm being weird. Uh, you want the players to uh, discover that. So what is it that the next step, the, the things in this scene that the characters can use their various abilities uh, to lead to other core scenes that draw them in. Or uh, once we've established the intro, do we want to think right now about what the big conclusion at the end will be and, and have a, uh, a beginning and an ending and then we're filling in the middle? Do you want to go at that, at that way, guys? Well, I mean, I guess the question about the ending is, is the ending the players, you know, get in a boat and sail across Lake Michigan slash Ontario slash of Holly to um, uh, to rescue the the prisoner because I mean that they have to sort of tie that off somehow and them sailing across the lake to rescue the prisoner seems like the big climax of the story right if it's not they they don't have any very plausible way of shutting off the supply of letters unless it's just one of those, well, weird doings was happening, but now he's at the end of the play and his last message is, oh, they've caught me, sorry, giant weather balloon coming. And and then you have a, an, un, a, a mysterious and odd and, and unsettling, but not a satisfying sort of a traditional conclusion. And I think a satisfying traditional conclusion is what we're aiming for here. Yeah, so... You know, so if the if the, if the the end is basically yeah you, you sail into the mists and rescue this guy who's sitting on a sandbar it's like Arcosa, and that means we need to the opening scene sort of set like, it won't kind of be that directly because they set up the stakes so the special person needs because maybe they are like you know sort of psychically trapped somehow and need to be freed and you free them by rescuing the poor stranded guy. Um. The intervening connecting tissue. My initial thought was, this is Ken brought the idea of a message board, where people are like you know, investigating the bottles and so forth. That they talk to the special person. The special person has been robbed. Their bottle has been stolen. All the person that it was taken initially as a bottle. They follow some clues, discover the message board, work out that, that what the key thing is taken was the bottle, track down the thief. And that provides clues that will point them towards the um, little sequest sequence. So that may be a bit ambitious for a quick for a short scenario, but I mean the 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 fact that if if you have the message board of fellow sufferers of sitting west, and those people are linked not by all i mean they are all linked by having gone to the beach but we don't know that immediately mm -hmm. but if what is linked is that they've all had mysterious break-ins in their house in which nothing was stolen that they know about because who keeps track of the nonsense you brought home from the beach mm -hmm. right and so um that can be your thing that you actually follow up on because it's unless you have some you know, uh, other previous investigator who's done half the work for the players who said, oh, the common element is they all went to the beach. I'm going to look into this and then they disappear. I think it's better if we keep the mystery sort of what's connecting these people. They've all had break-ins. And the person who's broken in is someone who's on the message board. Of course. 
but is um, was drawn there because they're an agent of Carcosa in some way, either witting or unwitting, or maybe they were the first person to get a message and it screwed them up worse than anybody else. And so they're trying to assess. They're you know maybe they're they don't even have a, a malevolent agenda. They just want to assemble all the pages so that they can have a complete copy of the play because it's it's got its addictive hooks in them. And so they're they're being you know they're using the message board. They're not necessarily psychically drawn to the play or anything, but they're using the message board to find out who else has pages of the play. They're getting ever more Carcosin in their methods. The first break in was perfectly normal you know they they got in pretended to be a pizza guy stole the bottle and left and then as they keep breaking in they start having more and more unsavory behavior while breaking into the person's house and then you know the the investigators stumble on it right as you know we're getting ready to where clearly this the next break-in is going to involve a, a human being killed like it was a pet being killed or a baby being endangered or something in one of the earlier break-ins. And so you can stumble onto a thing getting worse without having to play out every single, you go to another house, there's been another break-in uh, moment. And you can-, you well, can let's, uh, let's, let, let's start breaking these down into uh, scenes and the, the flow of, of uh, clues. Uh, so the, uh, so I take it the, uh, in the intro is the thing, the core clue, uh, the ex the existence of uh, the break-ins, that, that, that you discover that there was a well, the, uh, a break-in in their house that they weren't aware of? The, the intro, the core clue, is the existence of this only sitting west phenomenon. And then what leads you in can either be finding the message board or... Um, uh, that either the, the SP has gotten onto because they're messed up by their um, uh, symptoms or the third acquaintance has gotten onto. So the third acquaintance can turn them onto the message board or the SP can turn them onto the message board. I think the message board is, is the next uh, big clue home. Um, uh, okay. So, so message board would be uh, one of the core scenes. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I think you're going to branch. And that also follows the. Aren't, aren't you're, going to to, you're going to have to branch right off the intro. Because if the characters show up there and the break in hasn't happened yet, then the bottle is going to be there with the SP. So either you. Either the players can find the bottle in the, early on, or the break in has to happen before they arrive. The first break in has to happen before they arrive. Well. The thing is, when if the break-in hasn't happened yet, they go to the, the SP's house. Yeah. They're talking to them. The SP is like, yeah, this is all messed up. I don't know what's going on. Or maybe they don't know that it's messed up, but they're being talked into it being messed up. They look around the guy's house, and it's like everybody's house. There's a million things. The break-in can happen later. They go back to the SP's house, and well, the only thing that's missing is the bottle for some well, reason. It's, it's like Kim's game, is it? Like, you know, you go, go back to the guy's house, and, you know, you have to know, like, you know, there's a bottle that, that, that isn't there now that was there last time, which you, you didn't pay much attention to. Because um, it was just one of a bunch of junk and bric-a-brac on, yeah. on the shelf, like everybody has in their house. Now, now here's an advanced tip, though, <laughs> is that uh, there is often a problem that playtesters will report in any structure that requires you to revisit a previous scene, uh, because the uh, players often find that lightly motivating. And it's often sort of a sticky point. So what I would be inclined to do uh, was would be to have two possible branches from the intro scene, which I think is strong design in the first place because it uh, right away establishes that there's more than one route through. So that there's two possible core clues in the first uh, scene. One is the existence of the message board, and that you could discover, uh, you know, by uh, with your computer's ability. Or by dialogue. So that's one direction to go in. And then another one would be your architectural ability, which is your uh, knowledge of places and buildings. And you look around and go, hey, wait a minute. This has all the, I see evidence of a break-in that uh, no one here has noticed. And there would be uh, some element of the, the break-in that you discover that could uh, lead you in a, uh, a given direction. And so 
uh, we have the message board idea. I think we've been uh, fleshed out pretty well. And it's something you can assume in a modern game that investigators will look stuff up on the internet before they'll go to a place. And they'll go to a place before they'll talk to someone. And much of your challenge as a scenario designer and as a game master is to make them talk to people, darn it, because that's the, the essence of an interesting uh, investigative game. Because you can't, you can't imagine Columbo just going around, sneaking around places, and then he leaves a place, and then he pokes his head back in and he goes, well, malt shop, there's one more question. No, you need people. You need people to talk to. Um, so uh, do we have an idea for what a clue... Uh, from the break-in that could lead somewhere uh, would be? What would, what would uh, uh, this is a classic mystery solving problem is how does a, uh, uh, a clue in a place lead to a next stage of finding out who uh, did the, uh, the stealing? Well, the simplest way is that um, there's a footprint uh, that has beach sand in it. And that, you know, uh, that leads you at least to the concept of the beach. Right. Uh, in terms of leading directly to the person doing the break-ins, the clue is the only thing that was stolen was that bottle that I found on the beach. And so the clue is either talk to the SP and find out what was stolen or... Um, uh, uh, right, or and the bottle leads to the message board, is that... Well, the, the SP will uh, at some point point you to the message board because they're on it in theory. That's how the okay. break-in guy knew to get you. Mm -hmm. um, the The bottle uh, can lead you, again, either right to the, oh, there's messages and bottles coming in on the beach, or it can be uh, uh, an, an, another sort of a, well, I mean, no, it's going to lead you right to the beach at some point because the SP will say, yeah, I got that bottle on the beach and it had a message in it well assuming the sp is like sort of complementous enough to explain the background if we assume that they are sufficiently messed up that that you can't interrogate them and get like a sort of a full backstory of what they were doing and how they got the bottle then yeah i thought the message board was like a support group for people whose loved ones are facing west yeah right well, what it could, what it could, what it would do is, which is the same way, it it still leads from the message board. It still leads from the intro to the message board, right? right? It's just a different character who tells you that, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then uh, it's actually science, uh, the, the the science ability that leads you to identify the beach sand. It's like, well, what is this pile of sand doing here? And then you go, oh, there's something been taken, but nobody knows what it is, and so that it's leads not, you to not the f pile of sand. It's a footprint. The beach the sand is just right. in their shoes. Actually, one question here is how how wide a geographic spread is this happening over? Is it like you know one bottle washed up on the shores of Alaska, one bottle washed up in California, or are they all happening in this like you know one stretch of beach? I mean, it can I, be. I think by definition they all have to be on the same stretch of beach because that's the beach you get on to uh, find the way to sail to Halley. Yeah. Okay. And and if you're in a, a relatively large city, there's more than one beach. I mean, in Chicago, it could be you know it's the North Street Beach or the Oak Avenue Beach or the, you know, beach, uh, the promontory. There, there's lots of different public beaches. And so uh, it's easy to sort of, you know, spread it out across the city. You don't, you're not going to have necessarily one thing, uh, you know, one single point to go to. If, if you, you, you'll, you'll still get lots of, you know, going all over the city type adventure right and, and if anything you want them to get to that particular beach so you might want to pitch you know find a way for the sand on the beach to be very a uh, very telling revealing bit of uh sand um, i mean so if you've got, got, i think that the thing is if you pack too many of the clues into the opener then you've got nothing for them to find right so, so we've got two clues in the yeah. opener we've got the message board and the beach so the uh the footprint leads to the beach the uh computers or the talking to the uh, other uh, significant person uh, leads us to uh, the message board. Right. Um, so I think uh, at this point, uh, we want there to be uh, an antagonist of some kind, and that's the person who's staging the break-ins. We've got that already. 
um, and uh, and we've got our problem set up. So uh, the message board, where else can that take us? If you, uh, you discover the message board, uh, you discover that there's a support group for, there's all sorts of people who are uh, facing West. And the obvious uh, branch point uh, from there is to have uh, other people who've been facing West who you can then go and contact their loved ones and go and, and talk to, right? Uh, right. And if you talk to enough of them, because there's a group of player characters, um, potentially you're faster than the break-in guy who's just one person. And so in theory, you'll have an opportunity to get to one of the sufferers before their bottle has been stolen. Or maybe they live in a, like a, a, a very secure building with a doorman and good locks on the doors or whatever. And so, you know, getting into their apartment because you're a, a friend of a friend and, and can plausibly approach or you use various interpersonal abilities to get you into the building, uh, that lets you actually see one of the bottles and maybe one of the messages. And then after that, you, you, you say for an entire reaction of where the bad guy go out, goes after the players to get their bottle because he's trying to get all the bottles. Right. Um, so uh, I'm going to call these scenes West Facer A and West Facer B. Uh, when you're, uh, oh, let's give them names. Let's let's do that. We have the internet. Um, Behind the name dot com slash random is one of my bookmark sites. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so the random generator I uh, use uh, says that one of these people is named uh, Wendy Walsh. She's West Facer A. And then we have a uh, good old uh, Kimberly Vasquez. Um, and I think we're uh, proposing that uh, one of these people has had a break in already, and that can confirm that there uh, are break ins, and the other one has yet to have the break in. Yeah. And the, you know, if, if we're establishing an escalating uh, pattern of behavior by the thief getting more and more unreal or inhuman, that can be something from uh, Wendy's break in that, you know, your SP's break in was, thank God, not that bad. But Wendy's break-in uh, was pretty bad. That um, uh, you know there was there was you know child endangerment or you know a, a pet was uh, killed, and you're like, oh, that's that's not just someone trying to steal a bottle. This is getting worse. Or maybe it's right. it's just a strange you know thing painted on the wall or something. It's just a escalating sort of uh, sort of behavior because you don't want to maybe go right to. Uh, pet murder on the first break-in that they see, or the second if it's their SP's break-in as the first. You want to get to some. You want to get to that as the next one, so that you realize if we let four of these happen on our fictive watch, then this is going to be very, very bad. Yeah, we want to slowly build the unease, uh, particularly yeah. in, in uh, Yellow King, which is more about a psychological terror mm -hmm. than about. Uh, physical threat that's part of it but mm -hmm. um and also your players may like mine be very easy to scare so yeah right <laughs> uh, something basic in there so uh that implies then of course that kimberly uh ha still has the bottle mm -hmm. um and the fact that she has the bottle provides the opportunity to stake that place out and have the uh the thief show up uh, but also uh, having the bottle might send us uh, somewhere as as well uh so does uh uh so what what is the uh, having the bottle going to send us for? What other scene are we going to, is that going to also take us to the beach? Is that going to cycle us back to another thing? Or is there another place we can go uh, from having the bottle? Well, she has the bottle. Uh, when In theory, she also has the message that came in the bottle. Maybe it's still in the bottle. Yeah, actually, here's the question. Has she opened it or not? Like, you know, did she find the bottle and then like, before she opened it, find the message board... Like, or suppose if she's already if she does West Facer B, then she's already been afflicted. Like, 
Is it only the first person opens the bottle who gets the the weird Carcosan influence or not? Well, she's clearly afflicted. The yeah. bottle, as they see, is on her mantelpiece with the paper in it. Right. You can tell looking at the bottle that it's been opened multiple times. Like oh. she opens it, she looks at the message obsessively to sort of supercharge yes. her west facingness and then puts it carefully back in the bottle. And so it's on the players. Do you want to look at this message? Yeah. How, how fond are you of West? Um, and then that, you know, it, it's not another scene, but it's a decision point for the players. Do we, do we, do we read the, the message in the bottle or do we not read the message in the bottle? Either way, talking to Kimberly uh, will point them to the beach as will talking to Wendy point them to the beach yeah. because the, the common element, especially once the bottles are all starting to go missing, is, oh, we found those on the beach. And they can even say, we found them on the specific beach. We found them on North Avenue Beach or wherever, right? It, if you're looking for a specific point okay, so, on the shoreline. Uh, so um, I'm also going to suggest, though, that there's something about the bottle that will send you to an expert on Carcosa, uh, so that once you look and find the play, I mean the bottles can be like uh, I mean it, it can send play. you it can send you to like a a bottle collector on the internet in the city, right? There's a maybe he's even a red a, a, not a red herring, but he's he's a guy who's you know an expert in old glass and what bottles are like, and he's like these are absinthe bottles from 1895. I have no idea what they're doing showing up on the beach. And um, although it would be more uh, useful for him to know something useful than to Well, yeah, because he's, he's, baffled, he's right? the, the, so that, any uh, sort he, of obsessive behavior is, is pointing you towards Carcosa. And so he's, you know, heard, you know, that these bottles were used by a, by a coven in the city in 1895 as part of a ritual, right? Or something. You know, he's like the only place that this could have been was the old bar, you know, the old absinthe bar that opened up uh, Verlaine's or whatever. And that was, you know, shut down by the city during Prohibition. It, it used to be up on North Avenue, out by the beach. Anyone, you know, and then he can have a lot of information that he doesn't know is Carcosin, but the players, even if the player characters don't, the players will say, oh, God. Or it was an old, you know, community theater or something. Or the the bar had, um, uh, you know, community theater plays in it. Uh, so, uh, and that's classic gumshoe construction there where, oh, the bottle collector knows about the absinthe bar. And uh, I'm going to suggest that the absinthe bar uh, either uh, is the uh, headquarters of the thief or was the headquarters of the thief. So that you go there when he's not. Um, so hang on. So that's getting us uh, quite a number of scenes there uh, from the branch of the uh, message board. Uh, let's go back to the branch of the beach. What can we learn uh, from the beach that will take us uh, either to the? Uh, uh, so here's an opportunity to sort of double up. You could find a. Uh, you know, a pile of smashed bottles on the beach where uh, the disappointed thief has gone, this isn't real, this is just a Coke bottle smash. This is just a antique bottle from 19... And that uh, that could clue you to the fact that bottles are important. So that could be uh, another uh, way a smashed uh, bottle pile could lead you back to the bottle collector. Uh, what it's Because it's often useful to have different things that connect us uh, to the various possible theme themes. It could also depend on when you go to the beach. I, I want to uh, circle back to the absinthe bar after this, but it can depend <laughs> on when you go to the beach. If you go to the beach at sunset, uh, you get the specific effect, right? You see Carcosa on the horizon, assuming your beach points east or beach points west. But um, uh, maybe that's what it is. You go to the beach at sunset and there's a weird optical effect, even if your lake points east, as all good lakes do where you see a, a mirror sun in the east and you're like, that's a weird mirage to happen or whatever. You get a, a, a Carcosan effect 
from that point on the beach. Yeah, the um, the absinthe bar, I like the idea of there being a current absinthe bar, not least because it's another location. And also, uh, maybe the guy that runs that absinthe bar is the bottle thief. And the bottle collector says, if you, you know, have these bottles, the guy who's running the, you know, the new Verlaines instead of the old Verlaines, uh, he's offering a big reward for those bottles if you have them. Uh, and so the old absinthe bar is the one that was on the beach. That's the site. That's the thing that ties that spot to Carcosa. And then the new bar got opened up because of the, you know, sort of authenticity stuff. And the new bar is not on the beach, but it's got, you know, maybe rocks from the old bar's foundation or something like that. And the guy that founded it discovered Carcosa by research into the old bar and its habitués, which was the old King and Yellow cult from 1895 when the play came out in America. Right. So that gives us a way to go uh, the beach. There's a clue that leads to the old, the existence of the old absinthe bar. And then uh, there'd be a, a scene called bar research. Mm -hmm. I mean, the old absinthe bar research would then alert you to the existence of the yeah. new absinthe bar. Uh, I mean, the beach can have like a, like a like a you know a, a, a scoured clean foundation on it. Like you you see the 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 old foundation of the of the thing, uh, and then you can tell. First of all, there was a building here. Uh, architecture can tell you it you know was probably built in the 1890s. Um, you can also look at it and say someone has been pulling rocks up out of this foundation. Someone came out with a backhoe at some point and tore out a couple of stones from the foundation. And then that will hopefully lead you to the, let's go to the city records and find out what that was. Um, and we have uh, gone a good ways, uh, more further than you will most times you're designing an investigative scenario without asking ourselves very much about the motivation of our antagonist. Uh, we know he's in the owner of an absinthe bar. We know he's breaking in uh, to steal people's bottles. And we know that each time he breaks in, he does something weirder and more uh, dangerous. And uh, this suggests that uh, uh, he either uh, discovered a bottle and uh, was somehow impervious to its effects, perhaps because he was already exposed to Carcosa. Uh, but uh, I, I think we're agreed that his plan is to construct a boat that will take him to Carcosa, where he will uh, become one with the king in yellow allowing that he will become the vessel of the King in Yellow that will then <clears throat> allow him to come back to this world and wreak uh, uh, sadistic havoc on people. So, and is uh, that, it? I thought his plan was supposed to be assembling right? the pages of the King in Yellow to build a, a, a new text of it because you can't get it anymore. Um, well, the reason I'm, I'm suggesting this new motivation uh, is that uh, this will then uh, create the way for the players to discover the thing that they need to go and experience the climax, right? If he's mm -hmm. building a boat, that gives them a way to get across to the Lake of Halley. Possibly he's not building a boat, but he's trying to find like, the, the, the correct route to Carcosa. Does that mean Checkers can like, you know, get his boat for one thing and start messing around uh, at, at sea? And also explains why he's not at the bar when they go there. He's off on his boat. I mean, the, the thing that you can find at the bar if he's not there is his, uh, uh, not title slip, but the thing that says, oh, he's got a slip at the marina. Yeah. Right? And This creates a new scene, the marina. Uh-huh. And he's not trying to build a boat. He has a boat. He's got a perfectly good boat. What he's either trying to build is a, is a compass or an astrolab that will let him navigate there, or he's um, uh, trying to find, as Gar says, the the coordinates to steer for, right? That will get him to Car get him to Carcosa across the lake. I mean, right. And the reason he can find the uh, coordinates is that every time a bit of the page washes up, there's something written on it that says, uh, "No, like, here's uh, here's another uh, landmark." And so, right, when he yeah. finds enough of the landmarks, he will then have the compass that will allow him to get to Carcosa. Right. Actually, um, couple, of things, couple of things I was thinking. Number one, we've, we've called people West Facers. One option is they're like you know fa all facing like different directions. That's where all, they're sort of their gazes cross, or they're sort of like their sort of lines of attraction cross. That's the 
the gateway into Carcosa. Um, I like that. Yeah. Another option is one way you you like you know, navigate a boat, boat is like looking at landmarks on the shore. So it might be like you know, landmarks because like you need to like line up like you know, if if it's in Chicago, they would line up like you know, X Tower and Y Tower and so forth, and like you know, like you know, like you know, if you're like you know, on the sighting along like you know, the line of the old Absent Bar when that eclipses the uh, new Absent Bar, you're on the you're on the right heading, and they use sort of sail out until you line up with this warehouse or where's or with this lighthouse. Um, so, uh, I think from the number of headers we have here that we have something that would turn into a 7,500 word to 10,000 word uh, adventure. And we got enough uh, of these, uh, these clues for our scenario. So, uh, now's the time to start uh, filling in uh, some of the other things. So, uh, alternate scenes. Uh, are there, uh, we were throwing out some other sort of cool ideas that didn't necessarily have to go uh, anywhere, uh, but then make things sort of more atmospheric. And I think one of those was the idea that there was a uh, a coven connected with the old absent. And so that could be one of the alternate scenes where you could get, uh, you could do some historical research uh, and uh, possibly get an advantage that would help you uh, when you go to the marina or help you when you're uh, sailing. Uh, or help you survive Carcosa while you're there. Uh, so Carcosa and survival talisman is something I'm going to put, put in there. Another obvious one is the characters find a bottle on the beach and like you know can get um, a page of the play and some clues and also their own wonderful slew of psychological effects and, and um, problem cards from finding a bottle themselves. Yes, so I'm going to call that FYOB. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, yes, of course, you have to have an opportunity for them to uh, get the bottle and get all of the lovely shot cards and the hallucinations that go with that. Uh, Ken, do we want to throw in a, a third alternate scene there? Um, let's see, we've got... Uh... I mean, I guess the third possibility is that they stake out one of the apartments, either Kimberly's or somebody else's, and they uh, either catch the guy in the act or they, you know, he he breaks in, but because of his, you know, increasing carcosa and attunement, he's able to get away from them somehow. So a, a confrontation with the actual uh, uh, bad guy is not currently on our list. Maybe that's right. an antagonist reaction. But the only things where he tries to steal the bottle anyway, but yeah, you could have the players be proactive. The right, other and we already have a character with uh, uh with the bottle, so that's uh uh stake out at Kimberly's, so we'll call that. Mm -hmm. The other scene that's going to crop up if I know players is one where like the players try to work out where the bottles are coming from, they like use science to try to like, you know, map like you know, when the bottle's arriving. Like, are they, have they all been, like, you know, they've been, like, mapping the tides and weather patterns and so forth and trying to work out if the bottles are being, like, dropped off by a ship or is there a particular pattern when they're arriving? And that would just be, like, possibly a scene where, like, you know... Bottle, bottle science. Yeah, exactly. Where you can get spooky clues that don't actually lead, lead anywhere but, but, like, you know, make sense in retrospect. I mean, if you want, you can have the point that the bottles seem to come from given lake currents or whatever be an old uh, shipwreck, the ship that went down in 1895 or 1920 uh, or whenever you want it to have been. I like 1920 because it can tie into the Prohibition and also the repair year. Um, uh, does, does that mean that, that, that our putative shipwreck victim versus letters is from that era? Is that, that he's like, he might be from 1920. I mean, that's, that's a strong possibility, or 1895, rather, or whichever. Um, and then, uh, uh, but but the notion that there's a shipwreck out there in the sea, and then when they, you know, are are laking out there, that can be a obstacle between them and Carcosa is the ship that's still there, and then it has the wreck, and they're caught up in the in the shipwreck, basically, and they have to avoid themselves being washed up on the shores of Carcosa with uh, the prisoner. Um, just before we move on to antagonist reactions, I just want to. Uh, uh, circle 
circle back to the uh, stakeout scene, uh, can you suggest that uh, the uh, person staging the break-in uh, gets away? But you mm -hmm. do need to design that scene so that it can be extremely difficult to capture that person, but that there is an alternate set of events that can still happen if they do really well and capture the thief. Well, if they capture him, they can, uh, I mean, they're, they're still going to wind up getting on his boat and trying to sail to Carcosa because the bottles are still coming. Exactly. And he might even say, well, you need me to steer the boat. And yeah, of course, I'm the only one who knows him the, on the boat is, uh, Yeah, right. And of course, they have to have the sense not to take him with them because if they do, uh, he will try to betray them while on the boat. So uh, that brings us to uh, one possible antagonist reaction for late in the game called Betrayal on the Boat. Uh, which then suggests that it's infinitely more interesting if they succeed in capturing him. So maybe we don't want to make it difficult at all. Well, no, you, you can do it both ways, because either you capture him at that point, or you track him down at the marina and beat him up there. Either way, you end up you end up bringing him on the boat with you. Or right, so you make it so that the player choices uh, impact what happens rather than the, the heavy thumb exactly, of the yeah. scenario designer. Yeah. I mean, they have at least three possible opportunities to nab this guy, either at Kimberly's, at his bar, or at the marina when he's getting on his boat, you know, five minutes before sunset. Yeah. And so you have um, uh, you have three different opp opportunities to grab him. And then if you do grab him, we have betrayal on the boat. If you don't grab him, you've got to get your own boat and follow him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and by your and own boat, I mean steal a boat. <laughs> right. Or, or yes, or, or, or you probably steal his boat. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, if he's already, if, if he's beaten you to his boat, right? Right. He's like, oh, they're on to me. I'd better sail for Carcosa, even if I don't have perfect navigation. I don't have their bottle or whatever. Right. So that gives us a wealth of possible climaxes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One in which you, are, you have taken his boat. Uh, one in which you've taken his boat and him. Another one in which you are chasing him. Right. Uh, and, uh, and those are all, uh, so you want to write all of those so that they're all possibly interesting. Um, right. There may be points, though, early on in this thing where you don't want the main antagonist uh, attacking the uh, investigators, but you, you do want someone to come in and mess them up and cause trouble and danger. And I think the obvious uh, possibilities here are that there are lake ghosts, that there are uh, people who uh, have in the past received uh, these bottles, uh, uh, perhaps uh, they've been coming, uh, you know, intermittently all the all the way since 1895, and there's just been an uptick in them lately. Perhaps he got another copy of the play, so he or <laughs> another supply of bottles. Um, <laughs> but other people who who faced west for too long turned into lake ghosts, or and, they can be the ghosts from the sunk ship. Yeah, the the the, 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 like, the original Coven tried to sail out Carcosa. Mostly, it mostly failed. One guy got stranded like most of the way there. He's over writing letters back to the girl saying, "Help, help, help." Um, oh, so your notion is that when we rescue the guy, our reward is to be have our faces chewed off by a Carcosan sorcerer? Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I mean, there can definitely be a survivor of the yeah. old coven who's trapped in the time loop around the boat sinking. Yeah. Well, and maybe, so, what he's going to try to do is hijack your boat when you get past the old shipwreck as it's going down because he's been in that shipwreck since 1920. Uh, what I'm looking for here though is uh, uh, secondary enemies that can yeah, confront right. the players earlier on away yeah. from that. We've and, got and, tons of stuff going on in the boat yeah. scene. But ghosts we need, ghosts but, of the sunken if, ship can, yeah. can be coming on shore as right. the connection is being firmed up. Right, and our bottle um, thief has, has achieved some measures, either an agreement uh, with them uh, that uh, he will take them with him back to Carcosa, uh, and that's why they're serving him, uh, or he's acquired some sort of control over them through his uh, acquisition of the coordinates. I think explanation A is much better than explanation B, so let's say right. that he's got a pact uh, with the... Uh, or that the... His, his, he's collected enough of the information that the channel between the wreck and uh, Chicago is is open enough that they can start coming on shore without his involvement. They're just another phenomenon. Uh, well, the reason is, if, right. Um, I think it's useful, though, to have 
uh, hench villains who are doing the main villains bidding, right? Because right. right. well, that uh, gives them a reason that just makes obvious sense to uh, attack the players and interfere with their investigation. Well, he can also have an Igor, right? The guy that, you know, the, the bouncer at his bar, you know? Uh, yes. It's also good to have a, a, just sort of a, uh, a mundane antagonist. So he could mm -hmm. come after you as well. Uh, there are situations uh, where uh, having ghosts show up to attack you will uh, be uh, too disruptive and you could do that. So that gives us, uh, two main antagonist reactions and then betrayal on the boat, which is really more of a one option of a conclusion rather than an antagonist reaction. Uh, so so for, for an extra antagonist, if you wanted it, you've got patrons of the new absinthe bar. Where like you go there, get drunk, and are then like seized, they're, they're like under the influence of the bottle thief and like you will go off and beat up their characters and follow their plans. But have no idea why they're doing it. They're just like- You could also have a, uh, a green fairy <laughs> right, like a like an Ariel, like a, a a familiar spirit that he's bound up with this old absinthe that he's found. Because remember the 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 way that they found out uh, what American absinthe was like was they found an unopened bottle in New Orleans from 1910, and they siphoned it out and did a full on check. So he's got one of the original bottles, and in that bottle there is a green fairy. And you think, oh, it's going to be Kyle and This is great. No, it's a Honest to God, terrifying green fairy. The kind that makes you want to shoot Paul Verlaine. Actually, here's uh, the so that's four different possible antagonist reactions. On a practical level, you probably want two, and you probably want the two that are simplest to explain. Uh, and uh, I, I, if I were designing this, I would go for Ghost of the Sunken Ship and the Bouncer as the simplest and easiest to explain. And I think Gar and Ken might. Uh, since they came up with those other ideas, they would like those ideas better and they would use them. A uh, couple of ideas that sprang to mind looking over it. One, were, was the original coach trying to get Tarkosa or were they like, you know, bootlegging Tarkosa and Absinthe? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's for our flashback scenario that takes place um, uh, in 1919, yeah. right before the bars closed down for Prohibition. Um... And the other thing is so that uh, good one. So I think that gives us plenty actually to work with. We've got uh, our uh, our conclusion. Uh, we've got a way to get to the conclusion. We've got uh, uh, three different possible ways that the final sequence can go down. So there's plenty of uh, variation, and the uh, alternate scenes uh, uh, can all affect uh, how that. Uh, uh, final scene plays out, uh, and so you're not just uh, railroading the uh, characters, the players through a very simple set of A, B, C, D, E breadcrumbs, but you've got all sorts of different ways for those stories to come out. Um, and so, uh, and I think everything uh, makes sense and is simple and clear. And, Do you want to uh, spend any time thinking about the identity of the prisoner? I mean, we sort of threw up a couple of ideas. Do we leave it open for the uh, GM to suggest whatever is the thing they want to happen least or the most existentially terrifying? He's kind of a campaign hook, I think, as he said. Well, well, I think the players are going to want sort of solution to, uh, well, the and the sort of idea that is embedded in Yellow King is that uh, horrible things are cyclically reoccurring. So clearly the original guy who's trapped you know what he he owned? He owned the original absinthe bar, <laughs> and he was part of the coven. And his goal was to uh, sail uh, to the uh, shores of Holly in order to become one with the King in Yellow. But uh, uh, once he got there, uh, the King in Yellow uh, rejected him, or he repented, or perhaps uh, he was the one who invest. He, he's like the investigators, right? So they may get there and find out that. It's one of the, their 1895 counterparts right. who later in life stumbled onto the thing. And so they're saving their own character. Right. It would be the most Yellow King role-playing game thing to happen. Therefore, it's a good ending if you save that person. And uh, that creates the weird possibility that one of the players has a backup character in This Is Normal Now, <laughs> who is the original Paris uh, yes. character, uh, which is a complication because one of the ways to 
end the entire arc of a King and Yellow game is to go back to 1895 and kill all of your original characters. And so now you've, uh, oh, I, let's, let's not tell Antoine what we're going to do in 1895. <laughs> yes. Especially since he's been going out and fighting crime as Captain Carcosa. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yes. Uh, so there you have it. these there apps. I'm a mere process. Paris art student. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's the the uh, the structure of a uh, Yellow King uh, uh, scenario. That you will find that the each each game has its own particular scenario setup. Uh, those setups are uh, generally within the same basic parameters, but they're customized for each setting. Uh, there are other ways, as we've suggested, of doing uh, Gumshoe Adventures, like Ken has a setup that is more, uh, that he calls the Ocean of Clues, uh, which requires, uh, which is suits a more improvisational style uh, GM. Uh, it is uh, uh, a more challenging thing to uh, write well and a more tempting thing to write poorly. Uh, so if you're trying to impress us, start off with the one that has the clear formula. And then once you earn your stars, uh, then then you can perhaps be allowed to do what Ken does. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, our, our, our publisher is secretly uh, participating in this uh, in, in mime form only, and we saw some head shaking there. So definitely start off uh, with the uh, with this maze of clues format with a, a more structured setup. And so you can see that we went through the process of uh, starting with our idea, uh, fleshing it out, uh, helping it, um, uh, sort of massaging it, simplifying it, and then fitting it in the pattern, and then allowing the structure that is already established in the rules help us solve a lot of the problems for us, where we were going to start kind of going off in different directions and becoming unfocused. Just the process of going, well, what scene leads to what scene helped us sharpen everything up and make sure that we had something that was exciting, fun, unpredictable, has possible uh, different outcomes, allows a lot of player choice and agency, but is still uh, containable and uh, within uh, the usual word count and something that a beginning GM is going to be able to look at, pick up, understand, and play. Uh, any further thoughts, Gar, on uh, creating gumshoe scenarios? Uh, no. I mean, looking at this one, the Instead, I would do having got to the end of my outlines, loop back and start you know, straight, strengthening the initial um, parts. For example, you'd have the special person possibly to, like talk about being drowning or like you know, push the whole nautical theme and like you know, make, you know collect up the start, the start to the end of the scenario because make, make it feel like a coherent story. That your like you know, your initial problem was this person feels like they're like you know like uh, freezing death from exposure and then you rescue this person who actually is trapped on the sandbar in Kakosa and doing that frees your this person from the start. It, it, it all makes like logical sense. Or yeah, add more, foreshadowing. More sense, yeah. Exactly, that's the one. Right. When, when you're actually writing all of these scenes, that's when you're adding all the flavor, the things that people will remember. No one well, will leave your scenario going, that was really well uh, structured. They'll go, oh, this scene where the, where the sea ghost came after us, this was great. Uh, but in order to deliver that, you need the structure. Yeah. Well, my point is, you don't be afraid to, like, you know, if you, if you, if you come up with an idea, like, later on, go back and add stuff as opposed to using your, the existing text as unchangeable. Uh, Ken, final thoughts? Um, be, a, be I mean, sort of a, a riff on what Gar was saying, not just structurally provide foreshadowing, but be alert to uh, flavor things that you can put in. Uh, we have absinthe now as a sub line. So uh, sort of emphasize thematically uh, sort of um, uh, things like that, addiction, madness, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, the color green to go along with the color yellow. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you've got, you know, a 1920 shutting down of the old bar, 1895 uh, was a previously exciting date. So when you, when you can sort of signpost things into that but also provide thematic notions maybe you know kimberly lives in a brand new building that can't possibly go back to 1920 and that's why she's safe is because there's no connection to the past in her building you know things like that just stuff that wouldn't make any sense as straight up clues but that will subconsciously or thematically 
uh, uh, work for the players as they go through it. And they'll not even understanding why, but they'll be nodding and saying, oh yeah, that, that tracks, that makes sense. Oh, of course, uh, we're in the old part of town. Now we're going to get, you know, screwed over by lake ghosts. That I, I get that. That's our fault for ever going to a nice, you know, uh, architectural area. <laughs> yes, the, the 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 more heritage buildings, the more lake ghosts. That's exactly. Just lake that's ghosts just a, 101. That's just a rule. Uh, well, on that note, I think we can uh, uh, sign off. I hope you enjoyed this uh, tour through Gumshoe scenario design. I hope it inspires you uh, to create things uh, either for uh, the Gumshoe community content program or uh, to uh, uh, pitch things to uh, Pelgrane itself. So uh, thanks, everybody, and uh, go make some mysteries. <laughs>